Shalom. Good morning, guys. <clears throat> So we're going to keep going over uh, the law, over the Torah, over the instructions of our Messiah. I keep seeing the same thing as I've been saying over and over again. People are not understanding what righteousness is. People are saying that Yeshua came to give us a free gift, not understanding what that free gift entailed. So we're going to go and just look at the scriptures, read them in context, and keep conveying this to those who are able to hear, those who have ears to hear. And for those that don't, this is what we're going to start off with. This is the, the words of the Messiah. We're going to be starting off in Matthew chapter 10. And then we're going to look at some of the stuff that Paul said, um, because there's one of two things going on. Either people are missing the warning in 2 Peter 3:15 through 16, or uh, people are understanding what Paul is saying all throughout his letters. People that are able to go through the scripture, through the prophets, and read what the prophets said. And then if you know Torah well enough, you'll see that that's all Paul talks about. Paul's repeating the same things that were taught in all of the prophets. So again, the idea that the law has changed somehow, people people need to hear what the Messiah says and go by that. He was the one that was sent. Um, and I understand people think that Paul preaches a different gospel, but he doesn't. He's made it very clear. He said to follow him as he follows the Messiah. So that goes for anyone. Anyone who's speaking truth, Anyone who's walking in Torah, if your life is displaying that, then people are going to follow the example that that you're living based on that's how they're able to see your fruit, right? So as your as your uh, fruits are displayed, you're you're becoming a light before men, right? So you're the whole goal of our instruction is the Torah, according to Paul. But yet people want to say that Paul is preaching a different gospel. So let's see. Let's start off in Matthew chapter 10 uh, and verse 32. It says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father, which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, he will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to bring peace on the earth. I, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I am come to set at variance against his father and his daughter against his mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth the father or his mother more than he loves me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that take not his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. So I'm going to stop right there before I go any further. I just want to cover what we're reading right now. The conf confessing Yeshua's name means that you're keeping his testimony. You're following in his example, his footsteps. Um, and again, he's making it very clear this modern day doctrine that people are teaching that Yeshua is all about love and all of this other stuff. That's true to a certain point. Love is the goal or the instruction of the law, but not the love that we think, not the love that um, men have spun into what they believe love is. So if we go by what Yahweh calls love, then we'll very easily come to the conclusion that the prophets are speaking about the law, the Torah. This is the personality of Yahweh. This is who Yahweh is. Um, and again, we see Yeshua saying that he's coming not to bring peace, but to set 
households apart from one another, which is exactly what we're seeing happening now. And again, anybody that places anyone or anything before Yeshua's words is not worthy of him. Um, let's see. And then he goes on to say in verse 38. Uh, he that does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. About our own salvation with fear and trembling, if all you have to do is confess a name. Again, this should be pretty easy. Uh, let's see. He that loses his life for my name's sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me, him that sent me. He that receiveth a prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall see, receive a righteous man's reward. And whosoever shall give drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of, this, of a disciple Verily I say unto you, in no wise shall he lose his reward. Listen. Verily I say unto you, in no wise shall he lose his reward. Listen. It is our job, those of us that have studied, those of us that have gone through the prophets, it is our job to teach truth, regardless of what other people do on this app. If other people believe that it's just confession, and then they're double-minded back and forth saying, oh, well, yeah, I believe we should keep the Torah. However, uh, the Torah is not our salvation. Well, did Yeshua not say that he was the Torah? Do we not? Can we not all agree on the fact that Yeshua's words were his father's commandments in the flesh? So, again, we've got this. We have the Old Testament. And everywhere you see the word, referring to the word, it's always speaking of the Torah. Then we get to the New Testament, which was translated into Greek. And then we get to John 1.1 1, 1, and we see people trying to make Yeshua Yahweh by using that word, the same word that's in the Old Testament, meaning Torah. So let's see. Let me look at, um, let's look at uh, Hebrews 10, verse 28. It says, anyone who rejected the Torah of Moses dies without compassion on the word of two or three witnesses. How much more do you uh, do you think the punishment will be for the one who has trampled the son of Yahweh underfoot and has regarded as unholy the blood of the covenant by which he made holy and has insulted the spirit of grace? So, again, I think Paul knew this. Paul was, uh, like I said, very well, very well versed in the law. This isn't something that um, should be confusing for most to understand. In fact, we'll read a majority of what Paul's saying here um, in context, because this is where the willful sin, willfully sinning after coming to the knowledge of Torah, and those who believe that they can come to truth. And then just stop at a confession, just stop at the name without doing anything else after that, right? So it says, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 26, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse a punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the son of Yahweh underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which was sacrificed a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace? For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says Yahweh. And again. Uh, Yahweh will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living Elohim. That's uh, verse 26 all the way through 31. So the context is there. We could read the whole chapter, but um, my point being is anytime someone is going out of their way, 
they know that they're sinning, right? Everybody has a conscience. Everybody who's uh, walking after Yahweh and his son's testimony, I, I would hope people have discernment and hope that people have an understanding that it's impossible for you to walk uh, walk out your faith without keeping the law. If you're not keeping the law, you're not keeping the words of the Messiah, which is what he's commanded us to do. Um, let's see here. Let's look at let's look at some stuff out of Revelation as well while we're here. So these are here's two witnesses, according to those that believe that the law has been done away with. Um, is there people in here causing issues? All right. So Revelation 12, 17. And Satan became enraged with the woman and went to make war with the offspring of her seed. Those who keep the commandments of Yahweh and hold to the testimony of Yeshua. That's in the book of Revelation. And it's also spoken of in the prophets, right? <laughs> Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints, those who keep the commandments of Yahweh and the faith of Yeshua. What did Yeshua's faith look like? Did Yeshua not walk out the law perfectly? Did he not keep the Sabbath? I'll take it a step further. Paul keeps the Sabbath, uh, I think, 21 or 22 times in the book of Acts alone. So if the law was done away with, here comes Paul after the fact, having an encounter with Yeshua. And here we see him reasoning with Gentiles on the Sabbath days out of the Torah. Because again, the New Testament wasn't written yet. So if the Torah was, was abolished, as people like to say, which is not what the Messiah said. He said, think not that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill, to show us what it looks like to fully walk out the law in the flesh. Now. I want to make another point. The fact that we have people teaching um, that it's only uh, only based upon this free gift, not understanding what the gift is. People have that same mentality when they say that Yeshua nailed the law to the cross. If you understand prophecy and you understand what Yeshua was saying, the bill of divorcement that was written against us. So in the Old Testament, when a, when a man would divorce his wife or, or separate from his wife, he would have to write her a bill of divorcement. And in that bill of divorcement would be whatever it is that she did and all of the reasons why they're separating from one another. This is what Yahweh did to the children of Israel. So from that point, all 12 tribes were cut off. We see Benjamin and Judah don't come till later because the Messiah has to come through the line of Judah. However, later on, we see also both of those two tribes, the remaining out of the 12, also played the harlot. So they were also cut off. Now, if you understand what's going on in Revelation 21, where John looks up and sees New Jerusalem coming down, that is the remarriage or the reuniting of the children of Israel back to Yahweh, back to the Father. So again, what did the Messiah do? The Messiah came and stood in for our transgressions, right? He took our place, which even if we died, it still wouldn't have been good enough because it had to have been a spotless, blameless offer, right? So that's Yeshua, the son of Yahweh sent forth, who laid his life down willingly, and then in that, nailing this bill of divorcement to the cross, finishing or completing his father's work in redemption for those of us that want it. Now, for those that are seeking after um, being justified, people take the word justified, 
uh, and righteous, and they don't understand what righteousness is. Righteousness before Yahweh all throughout the Old Testament and the New were all men that were walking in the law and doing what the Father commanded them to do. Nothing less, nothing more. And yes, there were other things that Yahweh wanted to give to the children of Israel as far as how they were to walk, but they couldn't receive it. They were too stiff-necked, and Yahweh knew well enough that they weren't going to keep the ones that were commanded. Hence the reason why we've been in the promised land and then kicked out, in the promised land and then kicked out. The whole purpose of the Messiah coming back is to bring us back into the promised land for good. But here's the thing. Just as um, Benjamin, or, or sorry, Judah was willing to lay his life down for Benjamin when uh, Joseph and all of them were in Egypt. Again, that was a foreshadowing of our Messiah coming and laying his life down. He was willing to lay his life down for his brothers and sisters to redeem them back to the Father. This is the reason why water baptism is so critical. People keep saying that they're baptized in the Spirit. Being baptized by fire is not what happens to us in this day and age. The prophets speak of the former rain, which was the first measure of the Spirit given to the apostles to start the foundation of the church. They were walking with the Messiah. They were witnessing miracles, and they were given the power to do those miracles. Find that all the way up until Paul is shipwrecked and on an island, he gets bit by a snake. He cast the snake off into the fire, and the people that were on the island thought he had a demon because he acted as if nothing took place. The snake, the snake that bit him, rightfully should have killed him. Every single time. Okay, so where I left off, Paul was shipwrecked, bitten by a snake. And as I was saying, by all rights, the snake should have killed him. He shook it off into a fire, and the people that were on the island thought that he had a demon. Then you see Paul laying the hands on sick people, and they were recovering. That's in the beginning of the book of Acts. By the time we get to the end of the book of Acts, we see that Paul's own son, Timothy, had a stomach illness that he could not heal. We see that there uh, were friends of Paul that were falling ill that he could not heal. From that point forward, we do not see anyone else doing anything as far as the gifts of the Spirit are concerned. This is why the prophets are so important. They speak on the former reign and the latter reign. The latter reign, the second measure of the Spirit, which is poured out three and a half years and uh, mid-tribulation. That is when we will start operating in the gifts of the Spirit. And if you understand what will be going on in that time, then you would understand why the second measure of the Spirit is poured out at that time. Okay, so again, all we have to do is read this entire book in its context before we start jumping into Paul's letters. Because if you don't have a strong foundation in Torah, you're going to misconstrue everything that Paul said. Now, let's look at uh, Romans chapter 2, starting in verse uh, 11 through 13. So for those of you that say that Paul taught a different gospel, then either Paul is confused and he's going back and forth from one thing to another. He's One minute he's saying we don't have to keep the law. The next minute he's saying we have to keep the law. I would say... I would venture to say that for those that have studied Torah and understand Paul, it's pretty clear that Paul knows the Torah like the back of his hand. So in Romans chapter 2, it says, For there, for there is no respecters of person with Yahweh. For as many as have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law that are justified before Yahweh, but the doers of the law shall be justified. Is Paul off here? Does Paul not know what he's talking about here? Because 
he's making it very, very clear. Number one, because of prophecy and because that the, the books that were sealed are now becoming unlocked because we are nearing the end. These prophecies are now able to be read and understand by those who study and those who have the spirit of Yahweh dwelling in them. So the point being is anyone who died without knowledge of what's in this book is not going to be judged based upon what they did not know. That's what Paul is. Just as if you had never done something, that is the justification of the law. So again, verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are justified before Yahweh, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So again, anybody who didn't have this knowledge prior, before these books were unlocked, at all of the generations prior that were in a, a space or a time or a period where we had been cut off and not awake, will not be judged based upon what they did not know. Names, uh, the law, all of these things. And he makes it clear by saying that in another part of scripture where he's talking about that the Gentiles that do this, it's right here, I think. Um, For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts. The mean while accusing or or else excusing one another. So again, the fact that we have the Messiah teaching the law and telling us that every word that he spoke was a commandment from his father. And we can look and see that all of the words that he spoke correlate with everything the prophets said. He came to fulfill all that was written about him in the prophets, the Psalms, and the law. So the law of Moses, people are saying that's been done away with. It hasn't. The law is the only way that you will be justified before Yahweh, period. Yeshua's free gift was laying his life down and standing in for our transgressions. That was the only way for us to be redeemed back to the Father. So I agree, it's a free gift. But that doesn't negate the fact that Yahweh gave us commandments, laws, statutes, and if you don't keep them, how are you going to enter into the kingdom? By a confession? Catholics confess all the time. That has nothing to do with your salvation. It has nothing to do with the fruit that you bear. If you are a tree without fruit, what does scripture say is going to happen? Do those trees not get hewn down and cast into the fire? So your fruit are your works, not your own works, the works of the law that Yahweh commanded every single prophet to teach the children of Israel. When we were reading Nehemiah, we went through this. The people had turned away before they rebuilt the walls of Nehemiah and had fought, they were Gentiles. They had fallen away. And then we see that they accept the law. They read the law before the priests, the prophets, all of the singers that were there. They read the law before the people. The people agree. They accept. And then they start walking in truth for a time. And then they fall away again. Right? So again, not something that we have to guess about. The free gift is that Yeshua nailed the bill of divorcement that was set against the children of Israel to the cross. Also, his blood washes you clean. So the baptism of the uh, of the spirit is by water. The baptism of of uh, fire doesn't come until later. So again, I would strongly recommend those who want to understand more about the priesthood, read the book of Hebrews and understand how the priesthood, the Levitical priesthood shifts and changes from animal sacrifice. And then we see Yeshua coming under the order of Melchizedek. Changing the priesthood, which was already once a priesthood prior, because it was under the order of Melchizedek. So if you understand, again, I know a lot of people don't read the outer books, don't study the outer books. I call them outer books because they've been taken out of the Bible. The Ethiopian Bible, one of the oldest Bibles we have, has the book of Enoch in it. Well, guess who left that book with the Ethiopians? Moses, in the 66 book canon alone, which is not the full Bible. It's not, it's, not even, it's not even a Bible. It's the scrolls. 
these are these are scrolls that were given by Yahweh to the children of Israel to follow. And a lot of the most important scrolls that were written were removed because they contain all of the stuff that we are currently battling against today as it stands. Sorry, guys, I don't know why it keeps pausing. Might be the area that I'm in here. I don't I always have full bars. Everything's got full bars on it. I don't get what the, what's going on with the signal. My point being is there should red flags should be raised for believers when you see 45,000 plus different denominations of Christianity alone all believing that they're correct. And yet every single church that I've attended in a 30 year period of time have never in my experience and I've been to several free as if it's something new as if it's something new grace is not something new faith is not something new grace and faith were all in the old testament so when i hear somebody say that we're saved by grace through faith alone how is that how do you how do you come to that conclusion how do you get around deuteronomy 28 how do you get around the fact that it tells you that scripture uh, Yahweh never changes? His laws will never change. Priesthoods have changed. Covenants have changed. The law will not change ever because it's who Yahweh is. So again, based on Paul's own words, we're not justified by simply a confession of a name. We're justified by by doing what the Father commanded us. And that's right out of the book of Revelation. I just gave you two witnesses on that. Those that keep the commandments of Yahweh and the testimony of his son. So question, why did Yeshua say, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me? Why does Paul tell us to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling if all we have to do is confess the name and it's just simply a free gift? If the prophets tell us that the remnant of Jacob shall be saved, a small group of people will be saved because only a small two, three, four, five witnesses, and they still believe in their mind that their doctrine is correct and they're ignoring the very people that Yahweh spoke through. I don't have time to argue with that, but I will because it's our job as believers to combat false doctrine and call that out. I don't openly call people out contacted people privately but if i have an issue with someone i will openly if i'm gonna if i'm gonna call someone out who's a non-believer or who is saying they're a prophet i'll leave a post i'll deal with that person directly but as far as two brothers that are walking in faith if you have an issue with that brother you contact that brother you contact that brother privately and you don't do it openly And then if that brother refuses to hear what you're trying to show them in scripture, what does scripture say? You take two or three witnesses back to that person and you reason with them in the scripture and you come to truth through scripture, not through your feelings, your emotions. That's the issue with a lot of men today that are walking in truth. Men are becoming soft and because men are corrected or men don't agree with other men, They want to go cry about it. And that's not how we handle things. If that's your position and how you feel, what's coming is going to be very, very difficult for just about everyone who's walking in the faith. It's going to be a testing time for those people as well. But for people that aren't in truth, scripture makes it clear men's hearts will fail them for fear of what they're going to be witnessing. We're told in scripture that when the end comes, it will be like no other time on earth since the earth was created. We're seeing the ramp up of those things happening right now on earth since the earth was created. We're seeing the ramp up of those things happening right now. So let's go back to Revelation 20, 12 through 15. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. 
and another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what was written in the books. So speaking about the Torah, according to their works, the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Sheol gave up the dead that were in them. Um, then each were judged, and each of them according to their works. So for those of you that keep saying, you're not justified by your works, you're not saved by your works. Yeah, you're right. It's not your works. It's not the works that the Jews were adding to Yahweh's Hopefully it's back. All right, so let's look at uh, Hebrews 10, starting at 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Yeshua, by, new, by a new and living way, which he uh, consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of Yahweh, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. An evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who was promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up the love of good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as it is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much so much the more as you see the day approaching. Again, if you go through the New Testament and you look at how many times Yeshua tells you that it is by works, I don't know if this connection will be any better. See how long this works. <clears throat> All right. Let's I'm going to I just want to take a look at now that now that the light's green, I want to take a look at um, John five forty six. Actually, I'm, let me pull it up on here. So we can read it in context. All right. So here we see the Messiah, again, speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees, continually trying to accuse him of anything they could. And he says to them, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are which testify of me. So the prophets, all of the prophets in the Old Testament, were, were testifying about Yeshua coming, sent by Yahweh, the living, walking Torah who he was before leaving uh, heaven, because he says he came from heaven. So if he's already been created by the Father and then comes to the earth, he takes on the attributes of the will of his Father, which is why he never spoke a word unless his Father commanded him to speak it. So he's saying here, um, and you will not, and you will not come to me that you might have eternal life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you that you have not the love of Yahweh in you. I have come in my father's name and you receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. This right here, this prophecy is so critical because it's not just right here. It's spoken about in multiple places. And we know even all the way back um, to the book of Daniel, this was prophesied. 
that one would come and change the days that we worship and the laws, right? Which has already happened. They've already changed the Sabbath day. And now we're hearing people say the law has been done away with. And, you, and Yeshua is making it clear that he, he has come in his father's name, with his father's authority and power. And then he goes on to take it a step further. And he says, if another shall come in his own name, you will receive him. This is the reason why we are always talking about the name of Yeshua over the name of Jesus. Do not think for one second that Satan is not clever and not capable of deceiving you because the Messiah warned us that this is exactly how it would happen. All the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. We know that Satan is cunning. We know that he was given the power and the authority to deceive many. And many will have a stumbling block before them. And as you heard Jason say, that stumbling block can be removed from some, but some, it's permanent. Some, it's not possible to remove it. Some will not be able to obtain the knowledge that is written in the law and the prophets. And that's just based on scripture. How can you who believe and receive honor from one another and not seek the honor that come from only Yahweh? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you to the Father, Moses, in whom you trust. If you had believed Moses, the law, the Torah, you would have you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? So if the Messiah is comparing his words to Moses' writings, the Messiah is telling you right here that the Messiah's words are the Torah. Everything that he spoke, everything that he taught was the Torah, the word. So again, how do you expect to enter into eternal life by confessing and just saying, oh, I believe it's just a free gift and that's good enough. Even if you believe in keeping the laws, if obedience is not part of that, faith without works is dead. I've seen people try to hack up uh, James chapter two. Again, in context, if you read it in context, it's crystal clear what he's saying. Let's go look at it and then let's see what he's what exactly is James talking about, because it seems to me that people are misunderstanding Paul. They're misunderstanding James. They're misunderstanding the prophets. They misunderstand Yeshua. They take all of these things and they want to mix match and try to make Yahweh look like he's changed somehow. Yahweh's law was placed there for our benefit to keep evil from creeping in and causing us to sin. If we're following after the law of Yahweh. It's impossible for you to continue on sinning. That's the whole point. That's why the scripture in Hebrews 10 is there. Those who continue to willfully sin, there no longer remains a sacrifice for that sin. And not only that, he goes on to say that if you continue sinning, you're taking what the Messiah did, standing in for your transgressions, taking away the bill of divorcement that was written against you, and you're taking and trampling him underfoot because you know, based on your own conscience, whoever whoever you are, whatever you've got going on, based on your own conscience, you know if you're doing something that's right or wrong. And if you choose to continue on just believing this church doctrine that, oh, I just have to say I'm sorry and, and confess the name of the Messiah and I'm good to go. No, you're trampling the Messiah underfoot. So again, this is why I tell people, do not go get baptized because you're in fear of time running out. I understand that. I understand the fear that comes with that. I understand people want to be baptized. But the reason why we're told to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit is for very good reason. Number one, the Father's name is you taking part in that covenant, agreeing to the covenant that was made agreeing to the laws and commandments that have been given over and over and over in all of the prophets. The people would fall away. A prophet was sent. A prophet would say, listen, turn back to these laws and commandments. If you do these things, you're good to go. Now, explain something to me. I, the Messiah back then wasn't around. Gentiles had fallen away from the law. Yet, they could go back to Torah, keep the Torah, and they could obtain salvation. So again, 
We're taking what the Messiah did based on indoctrination in the way that these churches are teaching, and we're putting the Messiah, number one, what I see most of the time, is people taking the Messiah and placing him in the seat of Yahweh, which is very foolish to do. Yeshua was given the authority in heaven and in earth until he's made his enemies his footstool, correct? So he will rule and reign, but according to 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 23 through 27, we see that after the Messiah returns for his first fruits, the 144,000, then each man in his own order. So we have uh, the church, the daughter of Zion, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then we see that after Yeshua has made his enemies his footstool, the final uh, thing that he has to do is to destroy death. Satan is bound and locked up for a thousand years. After that thousand years, he's let loose. What is the purpose according to the prophets? Why is he let? Why is he bound for the thousand years that we're on the new earth? Why does it tell us in the parable of the wedding feast that both good and evil were invited to that feast? And when the king looks out and he sees a man that's not dressed in righteousness, he to lock the man up and cast him into outer darkness. The moment you go get baptized, if you're not in a place where you don't understand scripture, it's frozen again. Can you guys still hear me? All right. If if you are a respecters of, of of persons, you have committed sin and are convinced of the laws as transgressors. So, we're as believers, we're to bring people to truth. We're not to be in sin with them while we're doing it. We are to reason with them out of the scripture and not go back to our old ways. Once Yahweh brings you to truth and you see truth, there should be no reason why you're trying to um, stay on the same level as someone who's not walking in truth. This uh, James, we're reading out of James chapter two, um, and I just read verse nine. So, again. We've gone through multiple prophets, multiple examples of this. Uh, verse 10, for whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Again, think of all the laws that are here in the U.S. If let's just take the traffic laws. If I get pulled over and I'm speeding, did I break the law? Of course I did. That. That's the same comparison that's being made here. You're breaking the law. You're, you're guilty of breaking the law is how this is worded. It's how it's being spoken of. And how do we know that? Let's continue reading. Verse 11. For he that saith, do not commit adultery, say also, do not kill. Now, if you commit adultery and yet thou, and yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So I, it doesn't matter what law you break. If you're breaking a law, you're transgressing the law, period. You're violating what was given to us by Yahweh. So speak ye, and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judged without mercy that hath shown no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, though a man shall say he has faith, and have not works. Can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one say unto you, or unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you do not give those things which are needful to the body, what does it profit? So, if someone comes to me and says that they need something, I need food, I need clothes, I need money, and I have it and I don't give it. What profit is that? Is that not works? Is that not doing what Yahweh asked you to do by loving your neighbor? Are you not supposed to give somebody in need what it is that they're asking for, especially a brother or sister in the faith? Verse 17, even so, if it hath not works, 
it is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, I have faith and I have works. Show me thy faith with thy works, and I will show you my faith by my works. Uh, let's see. Thou believest that there is one God, Elohim, Yahweh, you do well. The devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest how his faith wrought with his works, and by his works his faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed Yahweh, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of Yahweh. You see then how by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. Likewise, also, Rahab, the harlot, and by the way, Rahab was not the harlot that people believe. A harlot, the, the word harlot back then means innkeeper. Rahab was a daughter of Israel. Rahab was not a prostitute. Likewise, also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them another way? For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is also dead. It doesn't get any clearer than that. That's crystal clear to me. You can have faith all day long, but if you're not producing the works that Yahweh told you to do, then you have no faith. It's dead. You can confess the name of the Messiah, like I've said before, until you are blue in the face. If you have not the works of the Father, which Revelation says, those that keep the commandments of the Father and the testimony of the Messiah. So I'll ask you again. In the book of, uh, let's just go with uh, what we were reading out of, um, we, could use, we could use any example. We could use Moses over and over again. We could use Nehemiah. We could use any prophet. Without the Messiah being present, although he was there as the angel of Yahweh, without him being present, in the, in the sense he was in the New Testament as far as him laying his life down. How were those people being brought back to truth and, and where was their salvation coming from? Even in the book of Hebrews, we went through that. Hebrews chapter 3 and 4 makes it very clear that those who Yahweh was upset with in the wilderness that wandered for 40 years, their faith not being mixed with works is why their carcasses fell in the wilderness. And then he goes, the author goes on to say, now for those that received the word and it profited them nothing, although we too have received the word, therefore we see that we also must enter into his rest. How do you enter into the rest of Yahweh? Is it by confession of the name of the Messiah? Or is it by doing what Yahweh commanded you to do? Because they go hand in hand. The testimony of the Messiah is your faith or belief in everything that the Messiah said and taught you to do. If Yeshua tells you, deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow me. And he tells you that you're going to suffer for his namesake and that the that all nations will hate you for his namesake. Is that not Proof enough for you that you have to do what he did, that you have to walk as he walked. People want the power that the Messiah had. They want to say that they're baptized in the spirit of fire, thinking that they're doing all these signs, wonders, and miracles when they're not. But yet they don't want to walk as the Messiah walked. Why is that? Why is it that people have such a hard time walking in the Ten Commandments? Are the Ten Commandments so difficult? Is that a burden? Because according to King David, the law of Yahweh was perfect. It was a light. It was a lamp unto his feet. He delighted in it daily. Are we not told in the Torah to write it on our homes, 
to have it memorized. You know, the whole purpose of having seat seats on is to remind you to meditate on the law. It's not so people can see them. You don't wear them so people can see that you're a believer. It's it's a reminder to you to meditate on the law day and night. Bind them between your eyes as frontlets on your forehead. That's the law of Yahweh that's being spoken of. That's the mark of Yahweh. Let's put it that way. Yahweh's law is the mark in Matthew 24 when they're being sealed up. Guess what that is? It's the Torah in them. It says those that, that follow the Messiah everywhere that he goes, they're virgins, meaning they have not chased after other gods. They're teaching the children of Israel, turn back to the Father. The Messiah never pointed at himself. He never said anything about him being God. He never told you to follow after other other than his example. People take that and say, Yeshua said to follow him. Yes, he did. He's talking about his witness, his words, just as I just read about uh, what, what he was saying about Moses. I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. How can you that receive honor from each other understand the things of Yahweh? For if you had believed in the words of Moses, you would believe me. But if you believe not in the words of Moses, how will you believe my words? Comparing himself. That's a direct connection to the law of Moses. He is the walking law of Moses. That law is the same law you see everywhere in scripture. Everywhere. It didn't change. Not once was it changed. But people are under this idea that because Paul's hard to understand, that Paul was given somehow a free pass to come preach a different gospel when we're told in multiple places in scripture that if any man comes preaching, even an angel comes preaching a different gospel, which is exactly what happened in Genesis chapter 3. If an angel comes and preaches a different gospel, not to listen to him or a man, let that man be cursed. Paul doesn't get to jump over Deuteronomy 13. Any man or any prophet who claims to be a prophet that speaks one word on the behalf of Yahweh, if that one word, one time out of the 50 or 100 things that that prophet is saying, if one word doesn't come to pass, Yahweh did not speak to that person. That's what scripture says. So, again, understanding the Old Testament and the New Testament, pretty important. Understanding that the law didn't just change. No one can come and change the law. The law was set in stone first, and the whole purpose of the law being on stone was to represent how men's hearts were. Hearts of stone, stiff-necked, continually turning away from the law. That is the difference between the old covenant and the renewed covenant. The renewed covenant is waxing and ready to fade away. We have not entered a new covenant yet. A renewed covenant is what is in place right now. We are currently walking into that renewed covenant. And that's in Revelation 21, 1 through 7. You'll see that renewed covenant taking place. And when that renewed covenant is established, none of us will be on here teaching each other anything. We will all know him. No reasoning with each other about the word. We'll all be all in the same page will all have the same understanding at that point. There won't be any uh, confusion about what Yahweh commanded us to do. We won't be denying his son, which is what many people are doing by saying, oh, we're just saved by grace through faith alone. You're not. You're saved by grace through faith of what? What is what does the faith part mean? Faith in the testimony of the Messiah, what does that mean? It means you believe every word he said. It means you're agreeing to do what he told you to do. If he told his disciples to go out and to make disciples of, uh, of all men and to carry on what he taught them, then what makes you think that you get a free pass? What makes you think you don't have to keep the law? Because the law was kept by the everyone in the Old Testament. It was a requirement. 
and then all throughout the thousand year millennial reign it's a requirement so what makes you think that this 2000 year period we don't have to keep it why are you working out your salvation why why did paul just uh make it very clear that we're justified by the law if it's not the case why does paul say that um, brethren, do you not know that the law shall have dominion over a man for as long as he shall live? So I think people are confusing Paul. And I think people need to take heed to the warning in Second Peter. Because people are skipping right over that, not realizing that those who are not studied in all of the scripture will take Paul's words and twist them to their own destruction. Paul's a stumbling block as was the Messiah. And he's put there for a reason. Yahweh knew that there would be Baptist churches, Christian churches, Catholic churches. He knew all that. And each one of those denominations, which we were never told to be in, are all, they all have stumbling blocks before them until their eyes are opened by the prophets. What were we told to follow in the Old Testament? What is repeated over and over again? Was, was, were we not told to be followers of the way? Didn't tell us to be Christians. Didn't tell us to be Baptist. Didn't tell us to be Catholic. It said that we were to be. All right. Hopefully you guys can hear me again. Okay. All right. Let's read this. Um, Matthew 15, 2 through 3. Why do your disciples transgress the traditions of the elders? For they do not do the ritual hand washings when they eat bread. In answering, Yeshua said unto them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of Yahweh for the sake of your filthy rags? Your traditions. This is why we have to have understanding of the Torah. Because Yeshua was fully aware of what Paul was going to be doing after him. He was also aware of the Torah. When he was being tempted in the wilderness, everything that came out of his mouth was a direct quote from the Torah. He didn't have a conversation with Satan. All right. Did you guys hear what I was just uh, saying about the Messiah being tempted? All right. So when the Messiah was being tempted in the wilderness, he didn't have a conversation with Satan. All he did was quote scripture. It is written. It is written. It is written. No conversation needed. Holding every thought captive. That's exactly how we are to handle scripture. But how are you to know how to hold every thought captive if you don't know the word? How are you to know what the New Testament is talking about if you don't have any understanding in the old? How are you to be a teacher if you haven't read through the entire book? The entire how are you to be a teacher if you haven't read through the entire book, the entire Bible, and understand what it's saying? How do we allow people to lead us along and trust in what other people are saying without studying ourselves lead us along and trust in what other people are saying without studying ourselves are we not told why is it okay with believers that most of the bibles that they read from that they openly admit to taking the names out over 7000 times this doesn't bother people this should be super. Even if I switched over to YouTube, it's still something. They're still doing something around my neighborhood. It ha they do it every morning and every night. All right. So Colossians 2, 8 through 9. This is for all of the people that want to say, well, um, this scholar says this, or that scholar says that. 
you were warned in scripture not to listen to scholars and people that think that they have understanding when they don't. Scholars don't even agree with other scholars. So until you can show me a scholar that can point us back to the prophets instead of giving their opinions, this is the warning. See that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the traditions of men and basic principles of the world rather than the Messiah. For the fullness of the deity lives uh, bodily in him. Again, this is where the Trinitarian doctrine comes from. Just FYI, the word Godhead is nowhere to be found in the original text. That was added to your Bible. So don't use the word Godhead to try to prove a Trinity doctrine because it's not. Um, let's see. Here's another one. Here's a second witness. Titus 1.14. And not paying attention to Judaic myths and commandments of men who turn away from the truth. That's two. That's two witnesses. Who is your teacher? Is it not the father? And who did Yahweh choose to teach us to show us truth? Faith comes by what? Hearing the word. And how do we understand faith? How do we understand truth? Study to show yourself approved. Who did Yahweh speak through according to Hebrews chapter 1? The prophets and his son. Was his son not a prophet? The people called him a prophet. Yahweh called him a prophet. So all of the prophets, including all the way up to the very last, every one of them taught the same message. And again, we can go back to the Torah and look at what the Torah says. The Torah makes it very clear that the word is not to be changed. Not by an angel, not by a man, not by a demon, not by anything. Anyone who tries to change the Torah is adding to the Torah or taking away from it, however you want to look at it. Very simple. All right. John twelve forty seven through 49. If anyone hears my words, but doesn't keep them, I do not judge him. For I came to save the world, not to judge the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word I spoke will judge them on the last day for i do not speak my own words but my father himself who sent me has commanded me what i should say and what i should speak let's go back over that very very slowly if anyone this is the messiah if anyone hears my words but does not keep them i do not judge him so the messiah is saying he personally as the son of yahweh will not judge you Based upon his words, right? If anyone hears my words, I do not judge them if they do not keep them. I came to save the world, not to judge the world. But the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The words that I spoke will judge him on the last day. What does that mean? What does that mean to people? The Messiah is telling you that anyone that hears his words and does not keep them, he's not going to judge you. And then he goes on in verse 48 and says, the one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word I spoke will judge them on the last day. What were the Messiah's words? The Torah, the will of the, the, will of the Father, the instructions of the Father. So for all of you saying that you don't have to keep the law, all you have to do is confess and receive a free gift and not be obedient to the, to the will of the Father, and you think you're going to enter into the kingdom and have right to the tree of life, you better go check Revelation and see who says has right to the tree of life. Those that keep the commandments of the Father and the testimony of Yeshua. Yeshua is the faithful witness. Um, 
John 7, 16 through 17. Yeshua answered, My teaching is not from me, but from him who sent me. If anyone wants to do his will, he will know whether my teaching comes from Yahweh or it is myself speaking. Again, another witness to what he just said. Anyone who does not keep my words, I do not judge him. I'm the son of Yahweh. But that person has a judge who doesn't keep my words. The words that I spoke, the Torah, will judge that person on the last day. For I did not speak on my own, but my father himself who sent me. He has commanded me what I should say and what I should speak. Do we not see every angel in scripture like this? Do we not see every messenger like this? When Yahweh speaks through a prophet, an angel, is it not Yahweh's will that's being given to that prophet? And then that prophet turns around and gives that word to the people. All right. Why is the Messiah called the word of Yahweh? We went over this uh, yesterday or the day before. I think it was just maybe not yesterday. Maybe it was uh, Sunday. Revelation 19, 13. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called the word of Yahweh. He's Yahweh's mouthpiece, people. When Moses saw the burning bush, he turned to see who was speaking with him. He knew it was Yahweh's instructions that were speaking to him. But when he turned to look, what did he see? He saw an angel standing in the burning bush. This is called agency. Yeshua just said on his own in John 7, 16 through 17, we just read it, that his teaching is not from him, but the one who sent him. Agency. Just like with every prophet in scripture. Yahweh commands. His angels are sent forth. They deliver a message to a prophet. And that prophet speaks the will of the Father because they've been given the authority to speak on his behalf. As soon as as one of those people mess up, King David, for example, was righteous and an upright man before Yahweh and perfect in all of his ways until what? Until he tried to have Uriah killed, which he did because he fell in love with Uriah's wife, sinning. And then what happened to King David? He lost everything. So for those of you that are saying it's impossible to fall from grace, it's impossible to lose your salvation, although I know King David didn't lose his. For those of you that are saying that once you confess the name of the Messiah, no matter what you do, because people will read that, that nothing can separate us from the love of God. They take that and they use that as a justification for an automatic free pass of salvation. It's not how it works. You're either hot, luke cold, or lukewarm or cold. If you are lukewarm, which means you're confessing the name of the Messiah, but you're not walking in his uh, testimony, then will you not be spewed out of his mouth? If you're hot, you're already walking in the will of the Father. You're already keeping the commandments of Yahweh, and you're working out your salvation. And then grace is there as a if you mess up, if you veer off that path, then you can approach the throne of grace boldly. But would you dare approach the throne of grace knowing that you're sinning and you just keep doing it? Would you do that? Would you dare go hang Yeshua back up on that tree knowing that you're sinning? I'm not talking about, let's say if, let's say if you're uh Let's say if you went you went to prison for something, right? You've, you've been punished, you're in prison, you're having to survive in prison, whatever the case might look like. You're, you know that you made a mistake and you don't want to ever do that again. Or let's say you're a drug addict, alcoholic, whatever it is. If you are someone who's, let's just say, I'm, talk, I'm not talking about people that use medications or whatever the case might be. If you're, if you're somebody who suffers in chronic pain, 
or if you have to take heart medications, whatever it is, if, if you're a person that uses medication properly and you need it, that's different. If you're somebody who goes out and buys heroin and shoots up heroin or you're buying illicit drugs for the high to get high, that is willfully sinning. And then you're going to the father and you're saying, father, listen, I don't want to be on this stuff anymore. I need your help. You're calling out to the father. He will walk you through and stand by you the entire time. But if you're doing it and don't have any intentions of changing that behavior, and then you're going and just saying, Father, forgive me, Father, forgive me, Father, forgive me. There's no, there is no salvation there, people. You're taking the Messiah and you're trampling underfoot the Son of Yahweh by doing that. This should be common knowledge. If you take any relationship that you have with any person that you care about, it's common knowledge. How do you speak to that person? Let's say it's a friend or a spouse. How do you treat that person? Do you, do you talk down to them? Do you communicate with them? If you're in a marriage and you walk in the house every day and you walk right past your spouse and she happens to look over at you and you just nod and say, hey, what's up? And then that's all you say to the, that person. And the, and the conversation is very minimal. Do you think you're going to have a real strong relationship with that person? Same applies for the scriptures. Yahweh wants a relationship with you. How do you build a relationship with Yahweh? You study his word. You get to know who he is. Then he imparts his spirit to you when you're ready. When you have his spirit dwelling in you, you start walking in that spirit. You start walking in the power of the spirit, not in your own power, walking in the power of the spirit that's given to you. Discernment, knowledge, wisdom. All of these things are given to you. Ask and you shall receive. And again, I've said this before. It's not about Yahweh, I need a house. Yahweh, I want to go buy this Lamborghini. It's not about that. It's about asking of the things that are written in this book. Knowledge and you shall obtain it. Yahweh's waiting, waiting for you to study these scriptures out to get to know who he is. Because how do you know who he is without studying? And yes, I understand you can grow in your relationship of who Yahweh is through your experiences after you've come to the knowledge of truth. But you don't just wake up one day and decide, oh, I'm going to be a believer today. It's not how it works. If you've been called of Yahweh, then you know that. You know because you have a, a pulling on your spirit to get into the word and study it. You have a pulling on your spirit and you can't stop because you want to keep learning more and more and more and more. And then you start looking at the example of the Messiah and you start to try to walk out that perfection. He is the goal of the law. Right. So this John 7, 16 through 17, Yeshua, my teaching is not my own, but of him who sent me. If anyone will do his will. He will know whether my teaching comes from Yahweh or whether it is from myself. Right. Then we read um, Revelation 19, 13. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood. Isaiah 63 tells us whose blood that is. So the Edomites, those that refused to turn back to the father, they will be trampled in the fierceness of the anger of Yahweh. Blood up to the horse's bridles. This is the Messiah, people. This is the Messiah you better get to understand and know if you're not walking in his testimony. If you're not walking in the will of the Father and keeping the testimony of his son, if this is the Messiah you can look forward to. All right. Um, Ecclesiastes 12, 14. Yahweh will bring every deed, every work, into judgment, including everything that is hidden, whether it is good or evil. You have wheat and you have tares. You have sheep and you have goats. You have good fish, bad fish. Trees that produce good fruit, trees that produce bad fruit. They will be separated according to scripture. One will be hewn down and cast into the fire. And the other one will enter into eternal life. But don't get it twisted because it says very clearly 
that a remnant shall be saved. And for this reason, for this very reason, this is why there are so many denominations. This is why there are so many different versions of canon. Do you guys know that Muslims keep Torah better than Christians? Muslims believe in the Torah more than most believers. That's sad. Considering the Muslim faith came from Abraham's first son, whose the promise was not made to, according to Romans 9, Ishmael, that's where their book comes from. That's why they have the Torah in their book. But because Abraham, before that covenant was cut, had uh, an Egyptian wife and a child was born from Abraham and that Egyptian woman. Uh, I'm trying to think of her name. Regardless, that first son is the very same peoples that took Joseph into Egypt, back into slavery or into slavery when his brother sold him. My point being is you can't hide your works. Hagar, thank you. Um, I'm going to read this again. I've read, I'm gonna, I've read these several times, but I'm going to read them again. John 15, 8 through 10. In my father is glor in this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. How do you bear much fruit? It's by confessing? Or is it by the works of the law? The works of the law were about love. So when you're fulfilling the works of the law, you're walking out the perfect love of the Father unto the Father and unto your neighbor. Then you're practicing the sanctification process. You're going through learning what Yahweh loves and what Yahweh hates. For example, the dietary laws. If Yahweh tells you that certain foods should not be eaten, there's a reason why he told you that. And we're starting to see some of the reasons why, especially when it comes to, to swine and pig's flesh. It's not about condemning someone else. It's about letting someone else know that when you eat these foods and when you do these things that go against what Yahweh calls an abomination, you're not only disobeying the Father, but you're also bringing harm to your own body. In this, my Father is glorified. In what? That you bear much fruit and prove so to be my disciples. Just as the Father has loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. What is he saying here? What is he saying here? The Father loves me because I, and I also love you, but the Father loves me because I abide in his love. What is his love? Keeping his commandments, the Torah. If you keep my commandments, what did Yeshua say? I never speak a word unless the Father who sent me commands me. Every word Yeshua spoke, every commandment that Yeshua gave, is written in the Torah. So what is he saying? Be imitators of me, just as Paul said. Be imitators of me as I am imitator of the Messiah. You will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Yeshua was chosen, accepted, laid down his life willingly, and taught us everything the Father wanted us to know. He became the tablets that were written on stone. They became flesh, representing the hearts of stone of the children of Israel in the Old Testament, and now the hearts of flesh of those that are waking up to the truth. That's your example. The flesh walking out the law perfectly. And then he goes a step further and says what? 
be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. What did Yeshua mean by that? Do you think he told you that just because he knew you were going to fail at being righteous? Or is it possible to obtain righteousness? Did Yeshua not say, these things I do, you shall do in greater? When will that happen? For some, there are some people, not many, but there are some that are walking out pretty close to being perfect. And there are those in scripture that are called perfect before Yahweh. Literally, says they are seen as blameless, walking perfectly in the commandments of Yahweh. So per perfection per our human flesh, knowing that we're fallen, is not the same perfection that Yeshua had, but it's us working out our salvation, knowing as we go through the sanctification process, okay, I shouldn't eat this. Okay, boom, that's one thing under my belt. I have, I don't eat that anymore. Okay, now I think now I found out through Torah I shouldn't be eating this. Boom, there's another thing under your belt. You're becoming more and more righteous. That dirty garment that you have on is becoming cleaner and cleaner because you're beginning to walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. You understand the fear of Yahweh is not keeping his commandments. The fear of Yahweh is following his son's example, keeping his law, statutes, commands, and commandments. Why? Because he tells us in Deuteronomy 28 what will happen to us if we refuse. The curse comes. The law was perfect, but the curse that was added to the law for not keeping it is what has been taken away from you when you start to walk in it. This is the reason why Paul speaks about this. If you're walking in perfection, that curse is removed. What does Yahweh say in the first 16 verses of Deuteronomy 28? Do all of these things that I have commanded you this day, and you will be blessed. Everything you put your hand to, when you come, when you go, when your storefronts, all of your merchandise, in your homes, Everything you do, when an enemy attacks you, they will flee from you seven different directions. But if you don't, the curse of the law will chase, will chase you down. The opposite of the promises that he said, if you do. So, having the truth of what the law says and walking in it, instead of fighting against it, why don't you try to follow in the example of our Messiah? Why don't you listen to Yahweh when he tells you to keep and guard his commandments and see if your life changes or not? See if he doesn't start revealing truth to you and see if you weren't lied to and indoctrinated by churches and men. Because that's where truth is found. Truth is found by studying this book out and understanding that it doesn't even just stop here at the 66. That's Masonic garbage. The 66. That was left there for a good reason. And for the people that aren't understanding that, you're not fully awake yet. All right. John 14, 16 to 23. I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper, so he may be with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not behold him or know him. You know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. In a little while, the world will no longer behold me, but you will behold me because I live. You will also live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father and you are in me, and I am in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and reveal myself to him. Judah said to him, Master, what has happened that you are not about to reveal yourself to us and not the world, or that you are that you are about to reveal yourself to us and not unto the world? Very clearly, guys, when you when I hear people say Yeshua came to save the whole world, no, he didn't. And you better get in the scriptures and understand that very quickly. Yeshua answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. My father will love him and we will come and make our dwelling with him. 
we, we, I thought Yahweh is a spirit, right? Those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We will come and make our dwelling in him. Is Yahweh more than one? John 4.24, God is spirit. Yahweh is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So again, this goes over Revelation 12.17 and Revelation 4.12, where it tells us very clearly, the only people that Satan is going to, to try to prosecute are those that keep the commandments of Yahweh and the testimony of the Messiah. And the, the patience of the saints are those who keep the commandments of Yahweh and the testimony or the faith of Yeshua. Very plainly put. John, let's see. John 5, 24. Amen, amen, I tell you, whosoever hears my word and trusts in the one who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed over from death into life. And now we're going to look at why he's called the trustworthy witness. Revelation 1.5. And from Messiah Yeshua, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. If Yeshua was sent to free you from your sins, point blank, your sins are washed clean. You get baptized into the covenant through the Father's name. You get baptized and you go into covenant with Yeshua. He washes you clean of your sins. And then you get baptized in the Spirit, the name of the Ruach, so that you can receive the Spirit of the Father dwelling in you, dwelling in your temple. Matthew 24, the prophecy of uh, Daniel the prophet. When you see the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, let the reader who's listening understand. Where is Satan going to be when that takes place? Is there a temple? John 119. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker with you in tribulation in the kingdom and the patience and the endurance that are in Yeshua was on the island called Patmos. Uh, because of the word of Yahweh and the testimony of Yeshua. John 3.14, or sorry, Revelation 3.14. To the angel of the Messiah's community in Laodicea, or to the angel of the Laodiceans write, Thus saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of Yahweh. Who is the Messiah? Our mediator and high priest? What is the purpose of having a mediator and a high priest? There's one standing in before you who has taken your place in judgment, who is mediating between you and the Father. His name is Yeshua, your Messiah, your high priest. He, he is the one that we follow after. It's his footsteps. But Yahweh's commandments, our Father, those, the will that Yeshua taught. That is what we do, the will of the Father. So are you a tree that bears fruit? Are you a follower in the footsteps of the Messiah? If so, obedience comes by that. Obedience to what? Obedience to the Torah of Yahweh, the law, the word. Uh, let's see. Now, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. We've read this many times. Not everyone that says to me, Master, Master, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Master, Master, did we not prophesy in your name and drive out demons in your name and perform many miracles in your name? And then I, Yeshua, will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, 
you who work lawlessness. Question. What is the violation of the Torah? Is it not lawlessness? So if the Torah has been done away with and we don't have to keep it, then why will Yeshua declare this to those that these most most Christians, most Baptists, most all Catholics that are worshiping Mary, the Trinity? This right here, guys, is people that are going to be thinking that they were operating in Yahweh's spirit. When Yahweh told us through his prophets that the first measure of the spirit was poured out and the second measure doesn't come until three and a half years into tribulation. The spirit that these churches are operating in, casting out demons, people barking like dogs, people laying on the floor acting like they're giving birth. These churches, these church leaders that these people are following that are laying on graves. I won't mention any names, but they lay on graves, tombs, and they believe that they can absorb the spirit of these old pastors and preachers and teachers. These are mainstream Christian teachers we're talking about here. Practicing Satanism right in front of your faces. So when we say, when Yahweh says, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her plagues. He's telling you to get out of the churches. When scripture tells us that Yahweh does not dwell in buildings made by human hands, he's telling you this for a reason. There's no compromise. I don't care what church you go to. You were called to come out of it. And if they're teaching you that you can speak in tongues and lay hands on the sick and all of these other things that you're a prophet, you're not operating in the spirit of Yahweh. And if you believe you are, then you need to go back and tell Yahweh that his prophets are wrong. And that our understanding on what the prophets say are wrong when there's witness after witness after witness after witness disproving what your opinions and feelings are all about. People can disagree all they want. If you're claiming that you can lay hands on the sick, then why aren't you at the hospital doing it? We know what speaking in tongues is based on scripture. So if you're speaking in some repetitive, using the same syllable garbage, you're not speaking with tongues. Tongues was given by Yahweh to preach the gospel in a different language to other nations. We see this clearly in the book of Acts. When they were baptized with the first measure of the spirit, the former rain, they were baptized with this spirit and then what happened they they started speaking in tongues and guess what all of the different people from all the different regions that spoke spoke different languages were like how are they speaking my native language that's how we know what tongues is and the other people that were there thought that they were drunk because it was super early in the morning and peter had to stand up and say they're not drunk it's like seven o'clock in the morning they're not drunk this is why Paul warns not to do that in the churches unless there's what? Unless there's somebody there at that time in that day when that was still taking place, unless there was someone there who could interpret what that person was saying. Otherwise, that person was to keep quiet. So without interpretation, without someone who understands that language that you're speaking, who can stand up and interpret for you, Yahweh commanded Paul to command us to be quiet. And yet we've got people on here that'll just sit there and say the same syllables as if we don't understand what you're saying. You're just repeating the same stuff over and over again. You don't, you're never saying anything different. Every time I hear someone doing that, it's the same syllables being spoken of repetitively, repetitively over and over and over again. So again, if you can do it, I'd love to hear it. I'd love to hear you pray in tongues. I would love to see you lay hands on the sick. Again, if I had the ability to lay hands on the sick, I'd be in a hospital right or I'd be in the hospital right now, walking from room to room to room. Either you agree with the prophecies that you're cut off, that are that Yahweh's face is turned away from you, 
So you can't be operating in the gifts of the spirit. And if you're not doing the basic stuff, if you're not keeping the law, you're not keeping the Sabbath day holy. Mm. Yeah, healings could very well be happening. I'm not limiting what Yahweh's capable of doing. I'm just saying it's not men doing it. All right. So when Yeshua says this, when he's when he's saying, away from me, I never knew you, you workers of lawlessness. He's speaking about the believers that think that they're operating in the gifts of the spirit. When in Revelation, it tells us that Satan's been given this power. Satan's been given the power to deceive. Satan will be able to do signs, wonders and miracles. This is the Trinity. The three unclean spirits. And they'll go out into all the earth and confuse the masses. All right. Matthew 4, 4. But he replied, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. He didn't say out of my mouth. Yeshua didn't say man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of my mouth. He made a very clear point to put yod heh vav -Heh there, his father. Romans 10.4. Now, this is, what we're, this is what I was leading up to. You come to truth. You're called. You all of a sudden start digging into scripture. Your eyes are opened all of a sudden. You realize you've been lied to. We've all been lied to for 2,000 years now. And that the prophets say that we would wake up. What's happening when Yahweh's breathing into them and, and sinews and tissues and muscles wrap around the bodies and they lay there lifeless. And Yahweh says, prophesy again. And then Yahweh breathes life into them. That's the children of Israel waking up, standing up. The remnant of Jacob, that mighty army. They're standing up. Their eyes are opened after the 2,000 years that they were cut off. It's happening right now. And it won't be until mid-tribulation, until that second measure of the Spirit will be poured out, according to the prophets. Not my opinion, the prophets. Romans 10.4 Yeshua is the goal of the Torah as a means of righteousness for everyone who keeps believing. Not just confess and stop there. The Messiah is the goal. Meaning, you will never walk as the Messiah walked on this earth. Your goal is to walk after the Messiah. The Messiah is the goal of the Torah. Will you be perfect before Yahweh if you're walking in his laws, commandments, and statutes? Absolutely. And if you slip up, you can then approach the throne of grace boldly and say, Father, I, I messed up. And you're right, Christians. Yahweh knows your heart. So when you go to do that, when you make a mistake, you can then go to the, the throne of grace boldly because you know in your own heart that you didn't mean to do it. That it wasn't something that you sat there and thought about and then when did it did it anyways. It's something that happened, heat of a moment type thing, and then you're able to go boldly and ask for forgiveness. Why? Because you have a mediator and high priest who spilled his blood to atone for that sin. But if you continue willfully doing it, there are no longer remains a sacrifice. First John 2, 5 through 6. But whosoever keeps his word in him, the love of Yahweh is truly made perfect. We know that we are by him. We know that we are in him by this. Whoever claims to abide in him must walk just as he walked. Did the Messiah come and tell the disciples, just confess my name? That would have been the end of the book right there. But whoever so keeps his word, in him the love of Yahweh is truly made perfect. We know that we are in him by this. Whoever claims to abide in him must walk as he walked. 
How did he walk, Christians? How did he walk, those of you that are saying you're saved by grace through faith alone? Did he do everything his father commanded him to do? Did he keep the Sabbath day? Did he keep the law? Was he sinless? So don't tell me that you're saved by grace through faith alone. Because without obedience to Yahweh's law, your faith is dead. Yeshua, the Son of God, is the only man that has and will ever walk this earth perfectly. There will be no other. But this is a second witness. The love of God is truly made perfect in you if you keep his word. This is why Yeshua said, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. He didn't say be perfect as I am perfect. He pointed you to the father. Luke 646. Why do you call me master, master, and do not do what I say? Hmm. What did the Messiah say? He said a lot. But he did not say, just confess my name and you're saved because it's a free gift. The free gift was the divorce letter set against you has been removed. The free gift was that if you start to walk in perfection in the sanctification process, meaning you're walking after the will of the Father, then you can approach the throne of grace boldly if you make a mistake. But otherwise, it's your job to be obedient to Yahweh's laws, commandments, and statutes. And if you're not being obedient to those things, and you believe that you're going to make it into the kingdom by simply confessing a name, it's not just any name, don't get me wrong. My point is, your confession of his name, seeing how he is the walking Torah, the will of the Father, the instructions of Yahweh, Seeing how that he came in the flesh to show us what it looked like to walk in the will of the Father. That is part of the deal. Giving a gift is fine, and I agree. It's a, it's a beautiful gift. But it is not salvation alone. Salvation comes through obedience. Salvation comes through walking as the Messiah walked, so that you're not hanging him back on the tree. You're not trampling him underfoot. He didn't die for your sin, so you continue to live in it. And again, if every single prophet was sent to turn the hearts of the children back to the Father's law, and then we see all throughout the thousand year millennial reign, we're going to be keeping the laws and Sabbaths and all of those dates. Why would you believe that we don't have to do it now? Why was that a requirement for all the people in the Old Testament before the Messiah even showed up? Why is this so hard to wrap around your brains? The only thing that they had back in the Old Testament was the Torah. And by adhering to it and agreeing to it, that was their salvation. Yeshua taught that in the flesh. It's still your salvation. The only difference is he is our high priest. He's become our priest, our mediator until the thousand year millennial reign is over. And then even then we will be with him and the father. But he hands back all of the authority that was given to him in his father's name in 1 Corinthians 23 through 27. He was set here, sent here until death is defeated. He's already conquered it. And he will destroy Satan. Satan will be destroyed by Yahweh. If we're not following in the will of the Father, and we're listening to churches who just say, all we have to do is confess, confess, confess. You're being led astray. 
And again, I don't, my purpose is not to come on here and be mean. I'm not trying to be mean. I just care more about your salvation than I do about your your feelings and your emotions or what you think you understand. If I'm saying something that's wrong, then I want us I want somebody to show me through the prophets one place where Yeshua disagreed with anything the prophet said. And tell me how that makes any sense when Yeshua said that he came to fulfill all that was written about him in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. He didn't come to fulfill it so that we could do nothing and continue on living sinfully. He came to show us what the will of the Father was, to remove the bill of divorcement, and to bring those that are lost back to the Father. That's what the prophets teach us. That's what Yeshua taught us. Not adding to it, not taking away from it. If you're reasoning with the world and you're parting with Christians or Baptists or Catholics and you're making excuses for them, you're lukewarm. There is no middle ground. We know this. It's okay to work with people that don't have truth. You can share the Torah with those people and you can share truth and you can point them in the right direction. But you are not. To make excuses for their behavior. You wouldn't do that. Most believers wouldn't do that with people that are um, living a sexual, sexually immoral life, would you? Do you condone that? Do you condone the unaliving of innocent children? You wouldn't make excuses for those people, would you? So why is it any different when it comes to people that refuse to believe in truth? Are you not told to teach, share truth, and if someone doesn't accept it, to move on. Because if you choose to continue to stay on their level, guess what? You're going to be pulled back down to their level and you're going to start believing the lie again because Yahweh will allow it to happen because you came to the knowledge of truth and then you decided to backslide. You decided that you thought, oh, this is unfair. We're treating people unfairly. No, we're being truthful. We're being honest. We're not uh, going to be a part of what, what is dark. We can pull people out of the fire, as Paul speaks about. But we are not to go into the fire with them. What good are you to anybody else if you, if you continue to backslide and fall back into the same place you were before? You came to the knowledge of truth. You started walking in Torah, and now you're backpedaling and making excuses for people. This isn't bullying. This isn't being mean to people. This is called truth. This is called being direct. Would you call Yeshua a bully for trying to share truth with you? Would you say, Yeshua, you're a bully? They, would, they, they said it back then. This is a hard word. Who can hear it? But that's not any reason to be getting upset and getting your feelings hurt and all of that. Women, I understand that. And I'm not trying to be mean to women. I understand women are wired differently than men. Women are more emotional. Most of, well, the day that we're living in today, it seems like men are becoming more emotional than women. But my point being is when you see discussions or, or, or uh, conversations taking place and it gets a little heated, that's called iron sharpening iron. And if your feelings get hurt by truth, then maybe you shouldn't be teaching it because there's 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 one of two things that are going to happen. You're going to hear truth and you're going to believe what the prophets say and turn, repent. Or you're going to continue on in that lie and you're going to get further and further and further away from Yahweh until you're so blind you can't see anything. Because Yahweh will do that. He will remove you from the truth if you continue on willfully sinning. And when the strong delusion is placed, you will be in that. You will be a part of that. 